Good evening. My name is Cynthia Lin, and I am a social justice education specialist with the Multicultural Student Center, and I am very pleased to welcome you all to Dr. Joy James's talk on women and political imprisonment from Rosa Parks to Ramona, Africa. So this program is the kickoff event of the Institute for Justice, Education, and Transformation, or IJET, speaker and trainer series, which this year focuses on the theme of race and place, movement, land, space, and power. Mm -hmm. Upcoming guests in this series this fall include a screening and discussion with the filmmakers of Criminal Queers on October 4th, Jose Antonio Vargas on October 9th, Rinku Sen on October 18th, and Tom Goldtooth on November 9th. There's a schedule on the table in the hallway that you pass and hopefully find in at, um, which includes full details as well as a list of, of amazing partners across campus and the community with whom we've had the honor of collaborating. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Hayden Center, the Multicultural Student Center, which houses IJET, the Political Science Afro-American Studies and Gender and Women's Studies Departments, and Global Studies. And without further ado, please allow me to introduce our speaker tonight. Joy James is, professor, is Presidential Professor of the Humanities and a Professor of Political Science at Williams College. Professor James is author of Shadowboxing, Representations of Black Feminist Politics. Transcending the Talented Test, Black Leaders and American Intellectuals, and Resisting State Violence, Radicalism, Gender, and Race in U.S. Culture. Her edited books include Warfare in the American Homeland, The New Abolitionist, Neo-Slave Narratives in Contemporary Prison Writing, Imprisoned Intellectuals, States of Confinement, The Black Feminist Reader, co-edited with T. D. Sharpley Whiting, and the Angela Y. Davis Reader. She is currently completing a book on the prosecution of 20th century interracial rape cases, tentatively titled, titled Memory, Rage, Memory, Shame, and Rage. She has contributed articles and book chapters to journals and anthologies addressing feminist and critical race theory, democracy, and social justice. Finally, Professor James is also curator of the Harriet Tubman Literary Circle Digital Repository, which is part of the University of Texas Human Rights Archive. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joy James. Okay, um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. So good evening, and uh, thank you to all the sponsors, Havens, Poli Sci, the Multicultural Center, Women and Gender Studies, African American, Africana Studies, and also the dialogues I've been having the last couple of days with people here. It's been very um, thought-provoking for me and really has provided a space for reflection, so I'm grateful to be here. So this talk tonight on women in political imprisonment is something that's based on my research and also a little bit on my experience around organizing. So I first got introduced in the topic when I had a Ford Foundation um, postdoc fellowship and I decided to take it to UC Santa Cruz where Angela Davis was teaching the history of consciousness movement. So you'll see that Davis comes up, you know, her image in some of these clips. And then from there, I began to work with people who, I mean, Amnesty International, I said a bit of this yesterday, we call them prisoners of conscience. There is no language of political prisoners in relationship to the United States. Um, but it's the language that's used by a number of activists and some intellectuals. So it's the language, of course, that I use here. So the slideshow is going to be screening while I'm talking, uh, reading from this paper. And in part, I'm going to acknowledge or upfront the limitations. There's so much history wrapped around the contributions of these women that it's impossible to really give an honest tribute to it tonight in this short span of time. But what I wanted to provide was a visual image and hopefully um, in the dialogue, what you know about their activism, about their contributions, you know, will be shared, but also that it'll spark interest in terms of researching um, their role in American democracy. I'm gonna start with a quote from uh, the MOVE women, who I will come to last in this discussion from Rosa Parks to Ramona Africa. Ramona Africa, of course, is a member of MOVE, the most prominent member of MOVE, I believe, that we would know would be Mumia Abdul-Jamal. And it's a quote from um, women who are incarcerated, 
And um, one has died from breast cancer, but the majority are still incarcerated. And this is the epigraph that I open with, quote, revolution ain't a principle that is applied when the oppressor is oppressing. Revolution is the principle of freedom even when the oppressor does not exist. Revolution simply means to revolute, activate, generate, move. So long as you are moving, you are free. But when you are not moving, you are in bondage. This is from Debbie Sims Africa, Janine Phillips Africa, Merle Austin Africa, Janet Holloway Africa, incarcerated in Western Pennsylvania. And due to the Freedom of Information Act and academic research, the United States now increasingly admits that it marshaled police forces and used prison sentencing to destabilize activism associated with black civil rights and liberation movements. And of course it's not restricted to this. I mean, Patrick was telling me the history about the Red Gym, so this is an appropriate place for the talk. The most recognized of US political prisoners is likely Martin Luther King Jr., author of the 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail. Before King, however, Rosa Parks was arrested and imprisoned for resistance to Jim Crow segregation that would spark the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott and help create King as a public figure. This analysis or discussion of imprisoned women in the civil rights and black liberation movement dates from Rosa Parks' 1955 incarceration to the 1985 Philadelphia bombing of the MOVE organization, which Mo Mona Africa survived. And I think when her photo comes up, you'll see her burn scars, right? During the movement era of 1955 through 1985, women arrested for political acts or associations faced brief or extensive imprisonment. One, for example, Angela Y. Davis was on death row. Another, Asada Shakur, escaped from prison to become a political fugitive now residing in Cuba. The roles of Davis, a member of the Communist Party USA, and Black Panther Party member Shakur are discussed here alongside those of Parks and Africa. Despite their diverse ideologies, varied political parties or groups spanning three decades, all of the women shared common obstacles and persecutions. Their activism was hindered not just by racism and sexism and government repression, but also by subtle forms of containment, commoditization as icons, the public's desire for respectable women radicals, it should be an oxymoron, the denigration of black female productive and reproductive labor, and what um, some of us in this term I, I got from Joao Costa Vargas, who is my co-author on the Trayvon Martin piece that we spoke about yesterday, and the quote, Museum of Political Imprisonment. In this growing space of remembrance of these women, it's important to know, and I, I'm not gonna read a lot about their productive and reproductive labor, but I hope we talk about it to some extent in Q&A. In this growing space of remembrance and selective amnesia about the most violent of the government's transgressions against progressive radicals, limited legal recognition is given to black women activists who entered prison for leading or participating in revolts against racial oppression. Recognition as a social convention and legal category grants legitimacy in the court of public opinion and standing in a court of law. In its absence, some radical women activists disappeared into penal sites for days or decades. A few were rehabilitated into public icons. That rehabilitation of criminals created iconography that would obscure the specific radical practices that led the state to detain them and deflect from contemporary politically driven incarceration. The 20th and 21st century black female prisoner demanding freedom from a Western democracy is a unique and under scrutinized political entity. She opens a window into the influence of race, gender, sexuality on counter revolutionary measures that shape contemporary political imprisonment as the United States differentiated revolutionaries from protesters. And I think this is important. I mean, we have these mass movements, but they're a coalition of ideologically diverse people. So if you think about the civil rights movement, everybody who involved was not, didn't think about race or justice in the same way. So Patrick and a small group of us were talking earlier that Ella Baker, who in fact was the de facto, she's not here because she's not considered having suffered political incarceration, but the first leader of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and along with Howard Zinn, went on to help found SNCC. 
wrote an article that was published in a newspaper to the Young SNCC activists, and the article was called, or titled, More Than a Hamburger. And so what she was trying to convey to the students that as important as the desegregation, the, um, the demonstrations at the lunch counters were the picketing of Woolworths, et cetera, et cetera, that was about a form of consumption and consumerism. And there were people that even once the doors opened would not be able to shop in particular places because they were impoverished, right? So that argument that civil rights in the United States is also about economic justice did not take hold. And I don't think it was an accident it did not take hold. It was discouraged that anti-racism would be coupled with an, a critique of capitalism or anti-capitalism. So I mentioned that she opens a window to understanding these complications. And that window closes due to the denial of politically fashioned incarceration in the United States and the reification of black female rebels as symbols of civic virtue. This, of course, is more true of women active in the Southern civil rights movement, such as Rosa Parks, Ella Baker, who I mentioned, and Fannie Lou Hamer, and less true of women active in the Northern liberation movements and associated with the Black Panther Party of both coasts. And we could talk more about the Panthers. Actually, there were two distinct Panther parties. You know, once you get to the early 1970s, there's the West Coast faction out of California and the East Coast faction out of New York, and the you know, cliche of fratricidal violence was when Huey P. Newton decided the East Coast had turned against them and sent um, and sent people to kill East Coast Panthers, as which the FBI was doing freely, so we could have waited. Um, during the movement era of 1955 and 1985, dating from Rosa Parks to the Montgomery bus boycotts to Ramona, Africa, and the Philadelphia bombing of MOVE. A number of women, as I noted earlier, endured arrest, abuse, separation from family, friends, children, and co-activists as punishment for their political confrontations. And so the women in the teens, and I don't say much about the teens, but there's one, Claudette Colvin, her photograph actually opens this. And I don't know if people remember or are familiar with who she is, right? So before Rosa Parks, I mean, people were always rebelling against Jim Crow segregation. So before Rosa Parks, there was Claudette Colvin. And the NAACP latched onto her and said, okay, we've got our poster person of respectability for civil rights. But what happened, she's 15 and she ends up pregnant. And so the unwed black teen, I mean, all the language that so, you know, has lasted over half a century today in terms of you know, stigmatizing someone and rendering them without political virtue was then appended to COVID. And so the NAACP dropped her. And so then when Rosa Parks appeared with an action of civil disobedience as an older woman, as a married woman, as a respectable woman, and this goes back to the talk yesterday about the angelic black, right? As the angelic virtuous black female, she could embody a movement where a sully black girl could not. So women in the movement era had to contend with the reality of specific forms of political violence directed against the people historically held in bondage or slavery, violence that also carried with the gendered and sexual dimensions. And that prior condition of legal captivity, modified by the 13th Amendment, which codifies involuntary servitude to those duly convicted of a crime, likely gave tacit permission to various groups, Klansmen, sheriffs, judges, juries, federal police, including the FBI, CIA, DEA, to use or sanction extreme extra-legal tactics to destabilize activists. As during the enslavement era, sorry, turning my pages here. As during the enslavement era, females were not considered to possess femininity worthy of male protection. Being a female radical offered little protection. And I want to spend a little more time with this. I think Angela's writing, um, and because she was one of the first in the 1970s when she was incarcerated to pin that essay, The Role of Black Women in Community of Slaves. And there were historians who had offered you know, quite a, a bit of information. And Angela's writings on this, the contributions of academics, and also people in literature such as Hortense Spillers, her diacritic essay, uh, Mama's Baby, Papa's Baby, right? Really kind of argued about the precarious space of the black female body, particularly as, in terms of political agency. That the kind of violence needed out on this body was unparalleled for two reasons. One, 
that anti-black violence was, was just simply systematic and normative in American culture, right? But two, the virtue that the female form is supposed to have as the, quote, weaker sex was not accorded to the black female form. So she was a hybrid form. So when Angela is writing about the disciplining of slaves on the plantation, and of course historians have written about this, if you were pregnant, you were still going to be lashed. What the slave master or the overseer did was simply dig a hole in the ground as a cushion for the fetus so they could beat you as, with as much severity as they beat males, but not lose one of the byproducts of their investment, right? So, and you know, actually, I want to fast forward today to Beth Ritchie's work, and she's at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She's done a study, and it's, the book is called Compelled to Crime. And she talks about battered women and how they respond to their abusers and how the prison, you know, I'm going to use the phrase prison industrial complex is all part of this, right? So if you're a black woman and you defend yourself against your batterer, right, and he dies in the process, you're four times more likely to go to prison than a white woman who does the same. Because inherent in white female identity is a presumed vulnerability, right, that needs to be preserved. Or there's an understanding that this is a fragile form. And that understanding was never accorded to black women. So when you look at the activists from the civil rights movement on up to the Black Panthers and the spinoff of the Panthers, which is a military underground movement that Asada Shakur was basically, I would argue, driven into, which is the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, the lethal violence from the state had no gender discrimination. So when Horton Spillers writes in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe about an uncut gender under subjugation, what she's talking about is the way in which, not that race erases gender, but that race mutates black female identity so that gender has no attributes, you know, attributes that are worthy of any form of protection. So the violence that gets meted out against some of these women is unparalleled. It wasn't, we were talking earlier, it wasn't the violence that's needed out against white revolutionary women who were in weather underground. I mean, it was, if you talk about the beatings, if you talk about Black Panther women, you know, being interrogated by the NYPD and then being held out of a upper story window by their ankles, you know, like, well, we'll drop you unless you tell, you know, that kind of cat and mouse, right? And you begin to understand why Angela didn't turn herself in to explain that she had no role in the Marin County. I mean, and why Asada didn't say, oh, the FBI is looking for me. Well, let me take a cab down to the local. It's just like, I'm out of here, right? And see, but if you don't, if you connect that kind of violence with Malcolm X, you know, the victimization of that violence, only with the black male form, then the, the space in which black women, radicals, and revolutionaries are negotiating gets lost. I mean, the terrain becomes unknown. And then they become these, these images, right? Where the specificity of the violence against them and the ways in which they chose to resist that violence becomes um, largely untold or obscured. If we consider four organizations supported by some of the women, you know, it featured here, their images, the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, AIM, Soledad Brothers, and MOVE, the ferocity of violence directed against members of these organizations who advocated but did not necessarily or uniformly use the strategy of law and self-defense is unparalleled in domestic policing. And I want to emphasize that. Um, if you study COINTELPRO, which was the FBI's counterintelligence program, yeah, it was a deadly program to, you know, workers, to communists, to independentistas, you can think of Leonard Peltier, who's still in prison, the longest held people and the greatest number are those who are associated with the Black Panther Party. But the violence meted out against black people, and this is the point I was trying to make earlier, I don't want to use the word spectacular, but that comes to mind, but it's both spectacular and um, normative, so normative that it becomes like mundane. You know, and if you think of the history, like from um, chattel slavery to the convict prison lease system to lynching. Frank Wolderson, who's a theorist at UC Irvine, he has this uh, phrase which I mentioned earlier that civil society is reserved for those bodies that do not magnetize bullets. 
and disproportionately black bodies magnetize bullets. So if you look at the FBI and COINTELPRO, when J. Edgar Hoover, despite how Leonardo DiCaprio depicts him in film, when J. Edgar Hoover decides that COINTELPRO is, is going to take on a new life in the 1960s, the number one permission for it is to designate the Black Panther Party as, quote, the greatest internal threat to the security of the United States, which is an empire. You're talking about an organization with about 200 people, average, you know, the age average might be like, what, 22, 23? I mean, it's a youth movement. Yes, they play with guns. Most of them are not trained. They, they simply, except for people like Geronimo Pratt, who's a decorated Vietnam War vet, they don't, you know, they're not real militarists. But they have this, you know, they're presenting a manhood, a posturing. They've read Robert Williams, Negroes with Guns. They've, you know, read Malcolm. They're trying to present this notion of self-defense. This is not the greatest internal threat to the United States, right? But if you engage in that language, you have a green light to use lethal violence, right? I mean, the language is absurd, but it justifies a whole array of dirty tricks that later when you have the church senate hearings, it's like, well, that was illegal. You shouldn't have done that. Torture is illegal. I mean, there's, we've talked about extraordinary rendition, right? about taking people from other countries to interrogate. And that went on during the Bush administration, whether or not it goes under, on under, you know, I'm not naive to think it's done with, right? But there was also rendition of taking Panthers from the West Coast to Louisiana and the Deep South to be interrogated by Southerners. And that was the same, the cattle prods on the genitals, the, it would, they weren't calling it waterboarding, but the dunking, the plastic bag around, you know, into your near suffocation. And again, you know, my argument is that there's something about black rebellion that becomes the boogeyman in the closet. And again, because the narratives of the suffering are so masculinized, where black women fit into that becomes more of an abstract question mark. If the imprisonment contained women and girls, um, then the gender and sexual dimensions, if it were studied more, the gender and sexual dimensions would be more pronounced, but not necessarily easily cataloged. The emotional and psychological disarray, disarray that follow violations, which include sexual assaults, from authorities reverberate into family structures, possibly causing intergenerational disabilities. And of course we know that you don't have to be politicized. You know, you don't have to be in a movement to understand that, you know, if you have a rape, um, your mother, your older sister, or an aunt has been raped, that that, has, that sort of destabilizes family structure. And in fact, to the extent, and people have done studies on this, where rape is considered to be um, a tool of warfare, to the point, and Hillary Clinton, I think, played a role in this, and to the point that in Bosnia and Eastern Europe, they finally got the UN to declare you know, that, that rape is a human rights violation because it's an aspect of war. So then you would have to think about the civil rights movement and the black liberation movement and the Chicano movement and the AIM movement and all these movements. So to what extent were women involved vulnerable to rape? And not just from, okay, so I stopped reading, so I guess you figured that one out. Um, <laughs> The rape comes not just from the external enemy, right? So you guys know what MRT is, right? I grew up in a military family, so I always, like, I'm signed on to military blogs, and I have a Republican wing of my family, and there in the middle, I'm, like, totally weird in my family, but I kind of, like, follow the narratives. And so MRT is military rape trauma. And so it, they finally got it recognized by Veterans Affairs, I, I think last year. And what was happening in Iraq, and to, I know less about Afghanistan, but in Iraq, is that the women troops were getting urinary tract infections because they wouldn't go out to relieve themselves when they were in the trenches because they were afraid of gang rape. And it wasn't from the enemy, the external enemy. It was from their soldiers, right? And so they finally had to create it as a diagnostic category. And now there's this whole debate about, well, then I should be able to get benefits, right? 
and be on disability. So they're still fighting because it's, it's like Agent Orange. I mean, it's going to take years before they, okay, yeah, something went wrong and we should help you get your life together. But women in war zones are this anomaly like they're not supposed to be there, except as bounties, right? The spoils of war. The women who are combatants in liberation movements are, you know, people are sort of puzzled. Like, you know, so what exactly is your role? You're not a comfort woman. Oh, you're a strategist, you're a leader. And so that patriarchal violence emanates from internally within the liberation structure and also externally from the um, legitimate opposition or enemy. So I want to kind of move a little more quickly. I've been talking in these, in these larger um, structures or larger ideas surrounding this. And I want to talk briefly about a couple more things. One about respectable female rebels <coughs> and the other about the museum effect. Um, the re-imprisoning of these women within the understanding of political incarceration as a museum, like as museum studies like it's a dead historical past where they become objects or artifacts that we've cultivated and preserved, but that have no real connection with the way we live and struggle today. So this part, um, respectable female rebels. Protest, po protest politics and revolutionary politics differ in their abilities to sustain and deepen organizing for radical change. Revolutionary politics prove more disruptive and threatening to prevailing political practices caste privileges and structural domination. Revolutionary politics are more often the focus of state repression and social disapproval. Social anti-radicalism is an extension and expression of government mandates that criminalize dissent, enforce law and order edicts, and promote propaganda or dif disinformation through the press. Society's fear of and disdain for radicals and revolutionaries permit its disinterest in and lack of empathy for those who become political prisoners. And so if you write some of the people who are incarcerated, or if you talk to them, like if you go visit them, or you know, if you go to Cuba, so I've been to Cuba, so I've talked to Asada, I think one of the things people are struck by, however you evaluate their choices, their political choices, like as wrong-sided or infantile, whatever, is how they've been forgotten and not remembered, right? And so however they envision that historical moment where we could change the world, which you, you know, I was young once, so you tend to see these moments like where possibilities are endless. And however they thought they would be remembered and valued. I mean, so reality, the cold water has hit, right? And it's this disappearance of them. I remember like from the Vietnam War era, because my dad served, we would have these um, bracelets where you would remember the POWs. So it's interesting that the Black Panthers also call themselves POWs. But the, you know, that remembrance through the artifact, through the, you know, the state saying, we should remember our fallen heroes and their sacrifices, whatever, that narrative does not append to the political prisoner. Because the political prisoner was against the state or the empire. And so to be a loyal citizen demands that one forgets. Or what remembers of the political prisoner, Leno Peltier, Sundiato Coley, et cetera, has to be someone who is not only an enemy of structures, but one's personal enemy and the enemy of one's family. So society's fear of disdain for radicals and revolutionaries permits this disinterest and lack of empathy for those who become political prisoners, even if they are innocent of the criminal charges levied against them, or their only true crime is agitation for human rights and against the state. Whether they are young or old, pregnant or mothers of toddlers, minors themselves, we tend to direct little attention towards the black females held in political captivity in mid to late 20th century. Perhaps the topic of rebellion against the democracy, as well as the suspect status of the black female are simultaneously um, considered too charge of a ground to explore these further. Rebellions folded into national culture increasingly find that their ideals fall under the ages of civil and human rights. Shaped by legal definitions, those hard-won rights now are administered by the state and society that initially opposed them. Hence, that society and its laws can control its accommodations to rebellions. 
Outside of their communities, anti-racist radical women are ostracized and harassed until society grants them a rebel respectability, which turns them into icons destined for the museum of political imprisonment. No longer feeling its traditional power structures and economic hierarchies threatened, mainstream society accepts, usually with modification, the hard-fought domestic objectives of radical seeking to dismantle disenfranchisement, Jim Crow segregation, wage exploitation, heterosexism, prison proliferation, and police brutality. I want to say a little bit more about this, about this rehabilitation to respectability. So if you, if you look more closely at Rosa Parks, right, in her history, one finds out, um, is everything okay? Okay, one finds out that she and her husband, Raymond, were forced to leave the South because the black community offered them no protection from retaliation, or not sufficient. I shouldn't say no, but in their understanding. So this is how she ends up in Detroit, right? And so there's this whole struggle, and there's an internal struggle in her family about Raymond feeling he's been eclipsed as a man because his wife and the female partner has this public persona, right, as a political yeah. leader. So there's a way in which Rosa, who is Rosa Parks? Like, we have no idea. Like, who is Martin Luther King? Oh, well, he's a national holiday and you can go shopping, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a way in which there, where radicals are rehabilitated into liberalism, right? So what we know about King was that he was peace-loving, he was pacifist, this is all important. What we don't know, we talked a bit about this yesterday, that he was against the Vietnam War, he was an anti-imperialist, he had a critique of capitalism. And once he began to develop those ideologies, his white liberal funders began to disappear, but respectable blacks began to not return his phone calls. Right? So Rosa Parks' militancy had a lot to do that sh with the fact that, like Ella Baker, she was a seasoned activist, and she had seen a lot. And so the way in which she and Raymond moved through the world was more like Ella Baker, it's more than a hamburger. This, you know, integrate, you know, Malcolm would say, you know, what's the point of integrating to a burning house? And he had all these little cookie statements, right? But the, what he's communicating is, this democracy is insufficient. And if it is presented as the gold standard, and the, the, you know, the sum of your political desire, then you've deluded yourself and you've, new, you've you like de derailed your movement, right? So Parks has to flee because black people, once they're allowed to buy accommodations to sit in the front of the bus, to shop, et cetera, et cetera, don't really have use for Rosa Parks anymore. Just like the NAACP did not really have a use for Claudette Colvin. I mean, you're 15, you're pregnant, you're shamed. Does anybody think about, do you need money? You know, who's gonna help you take care of the baby? So there's a political um, usefulness, the, the productive, reproductive labor, right, of black women and girls but to help fuel movements. But their particular needs and concerns, particularly if they're shaped by radical ideology, are able to be jettisoned, right? And this, this cult of respectability that we've sought is one that's not limited to the civil rights movement. I'm going to fast forward to Angela Davis. I mean, Angela Davis is out of prison because she was acquitted of all ch charges. She, you know, she won in the court of law, right? And so there was a way in which the multiracial campaigns, the international campaigns to free Angela Davis that were also fueled by the Communist Party, including European communists, both in Eastern and Western Europe, right, who were very useful, very helpful in, in bringing um, this trial to international light, right? There are ways in which Angela becomes embraced within acceptable American society because it sort of validates the judicial system. She was, you know, so it works, right? You had your day in court, and so it proves that even if it may be an exception, and actually she is an exception, if you look at a number of the women who are in the Black Panther Party and definitely the women in the move, that it just become an exception. And so to be on the cover of Newsweek, right? To be featured 
beyond a FBI wanted poster has to do with her, I'm going to use Sadia Hartman's term, um, perhaps not exactly in the way that she uses it in scenes of subjection, but there's a fungibility. So the respectability is tied to mainstream America's willingness to embrace you as a radical. And once you are embraced as a radical, your radicalism has mutated into something else. Because what it selectively remembers of you has to be compatible with the dominant political ideology. It can't remember that you supported the Soledad brothers. It can't remember that George Jackson dies from a bullet to the head. It can't remember the Attica uprising that it has sparked from his assassination in prison. It can't remember like all these things which call the democracy into question. So the women's, and this is where the, I had started out, the women's specific contributions are secondary to their iconic function. Now when you get to the move women, and Sophia Bukhari is a member of the Black Panther Party, and I'll say more about her um, in the QA. When you get to the move women, you find a particular kind of tension because they cannot be rehabilitated within American respectability. And even if you, do people know about MOVE and the bombing? Pretty much, we could talk more. Well, 1985, under the first black mayor elected to the city of brotherly love, Wilson Good, there was a bombing of a house on Osage Avenue. And actually there's a frontline video on that, or documentary that was done by um, the late black feminist Tony K. Bambara, right, who's from Philadelphia. And the MOVE organization was based on the teachings of John Africa. Right? And MOVE was going to be problematic, not just to white America, but MOVE was problematic to black America. And remember Jesse Jackson made that quip, why don't they comb their hair, right? I mean, because it's, again, this presentation of the respectable black. So if you're going to be a radical black, you need to be a radical in the vein of Rosa Parks. Like you can maybe be darker and you can be less genteel or educated, but you still have to have this middle class persona. The move went a completely opposite direction. They homeschooled their children, they didn't hold jobs, they had confrontations with the police. There was a 1978 shootout where a police officer died and everybody in the move house, there was a police raid, was arrested for a collective murder, even though he likely died in the crossfire. And this is also what is argued about Asada Shakur's case in the New Jersey you know, Turnpike, right? So whereas in 1963, when you had the bombing of the Birmingham church after Martin Luther King's um, speech, like that opened hearts, right? I have a dream, right? So that resonates to the hilltops of, you know, I can't remember all the places I've been in the South, but it resonates. And then weeks to a month and a half later, what is the response? There's someone places a bomb. And again, I haven't seen a lot of writing about this, but my understanding is it's placed in the girls and women's bathroom. So of all places, again, I'm wondering about the gender of the Klansmen that bombed the church, right? So four girls are blown up. Angela Davis talks about how this becomes a politicizing moment because one of the mothers, you know, calls Angela's mother, I need to go get my daughter, that church has been bombed, let's go pick them up because the girls are going to be in total disarray. And Angela writes in her memoir how her mother's driving her next door, her neighbor down. And what they find, you know, they find a foot in a shoe, right? And so this, this whole disarray of what it means to be safe or what it means to belong is a memory. I mean, because this is a contestation of like, is this America? It's Fannie Lou Hamer's speech, right? 1964 um, in the DNC. All of that has to be forgotten if you're to be rehabilitated. Now, 1963, we remember those children, those girls, right? And Spike Lee does the Four Little Girls documentary. And people in the mainstream movement can understand the radicalism of these girls because they were activists. They weren't purely victims. You know, they're 11, 12, 13 year old, 14 year old activists. But we don't remember the move women and children in the same light because they lack the inherent respectability of middle class assimilation and desire. Because, yeah, they don't necessarily wash every day, they let their kids forge on the street. They put mount loudspeakers, they're using expletives. 
because they want a confrontation with the police to get, I read the excerpt from the women you saw the move nine, they want to get people out of prison. So they move into a middle class black neighborhood and they're like, look, we're going to put pressure on you because you're law abiding, you work for the post office, you work in the mayor's office, your city clerk, whatever, you're respectable. We're going to put pressure on respectable black people. You're going to be pressure on this city and we're going to bring attention to our incarcerated people, right? And if you have a time, a moment to look at the documentary, the, the way Tony K. Babara closes it, it's of black middle class people weeping after the bombing. Because, and they're sort of stunned, right? Because MOVE had an understanding of what it meant to be black in rebellion that the black middle class did not. And so their narrative becomes, in a way, like the men of Attica, if you look at the PBS documentary, Eyes on the Pride, Nation of Law, the Attica segment. Well, we knew they were going to come in, but we had no idea they were going to come in like that. That's what Big Black says in the documentary. And black people are stunned because not only did the city watch and let the whole street burn down, and that's, the, that's collective punishment. It's like, let's just make a statement while we're here, right? But to drop an aerial explosive device, and that's only been done twice in the history of the United States. One in what was called Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, right? And the second time was 1985. Those are the only domestic aerial bombings from the state, and they've all been against black communities. And what they used were explosives that were a Vietnam surplus, which you don't even, like, how did the local city get that? But they did, right? So they bombed the house, they dropped the explosive device, People in the street are screaming, there are children in the house. The police are keeping the neighbors from the house, and you simply watch it burn. And in part of the documentary, it speculates, well, people were trying to escape from the back, but there were sharpshooters from the back, and bodies were burned beyond recognition. So we're not quite sure if people got shot and thrown back in. It's all speculative, right? But it becomes this moment where it's easier to rally for Mumia, like off death row, than it is to have a political embrace with MOVE. And so the women of MOVE, who are here, she died from breast cancer inside, um, and who've been in for like over 20 years, some of them, right? So 1970, some of them are going in. The women of MOVE and Ramona, of course, remain on the fringe of our consciousness because they lack respectability. So it becomes this weird moment where race is in everything because this respectable black, like the 44th president, has like a kind of what my ex would call a civil rights credit card. Like you could just swipe it and the doors open and you can pay for things and you get access. And you know, the move women possess none of that. So I want to end then by talking about this um, imprisonment, being kept as in the Museum of Political Imprisonment. Most will encounter the women activists briefly you know, discussed here through popular or academic culture, which itself is shaped by the Museum of Political Imprisonment. The organizing of resistance data creates a museum effect that details movements as it derails movement. The museum effect places revolutionary activism into a container. Contained, organizing distances spectacle from spectator, providing both commodity and consumer. As noted earlier, the cult of the respectable rebel determines who is most remembered and how. For example, the most remembered female activist who was incarcerated is Rosa Parks. Her, however, her radical practice or praxis is often forgotten, diminished in the telling and selling of her story as a national treasure. Curators determine entry into the museum. Archivists, including academics and the activists themselves, contribute oral history, personal writings, and visual culture. The museum effect tends to emerge after both the specific organization and the movement cease to effectively exist as an alternative to prevailing political power. Even after key leadership dies and a movement organization ends, sometimes from the combined pressures of internal factionalism and political intimidation, its activists can remain in prison or as prison fugitives for decades. Packaging memory is part of the museum effect. Curators isolate the women by generation, political organization, and ideologies. 
They can valorize state approved rebels, ignore those currently wanted by the FBI, or refuse new trials. Administrators of exhibits can focus on the freed, exiled, or dead, not facing the current conditions of incarceration and trial malfeasance. Political imprisonment and anti-black and anti-female repression become artifacts themselves. The lineages between the civil rights, black liberation, and post-movement eras are shaped by intergenerational relationships, great-grandmothers to grandmothers to mothers to daughters in struggle. The museum's isolating corridors often cannot reflect lineage and intergenerational responsibilities expressed in memoirs, such as the autobiographies of Angela Y. Davis and Asada Shakur, both of them, of course, listed on the FBI's most wanted list. Writing of their youth, the women state that they had to engage in political struggle in order to honor their ancestors. Cultural, educational, or popular museum exhibits often isolate women as specimens of American exceptionalism, separating them from each other and from movement writ large. Housed in the women's section, off the main entrance in a smaller, sparser, less frequented womb, Gender segregation reinforces their service to male personas and male-led movements which were female organized in part. Grouped with but not in conversation with other women, they are still linked in the public's mind as the helpmates or partners of influential male rebels. Isolation also alters time. The museum effect suggests a finite starting date for political confrontations with repression, a discernible timeline of sacrifice and struggle, a marked ending of the conflict through a redemptive narrative of closure, generally viewed as the triumph of democracy. Incarcerated or fugitive women, though, disrupt historical timelines and redemptive narratives. To escape the Museum of Black Political Imprisonment requires then a form of labor that would transform the museum into a site of engagement rather than a tourist destination or, ar or academic archive. The museum functions as a grave of sorts. It can bury contemporary activism as it unearths historical resistance. In addition, emotional intelligence that led to rebellions, suffering and trauma can be rendered spectacles. Thus, resistance itself becomes spectacle. Artifacts are inactive, even in interactive settings, and suggest the only organic entity capable of changing or disrupting one's life is the law. Spectators, when not engaged, may not support activists who resist until pacification. If the archive replaces or becomes the new activism, then the archivist supplants the activist in telling the story and shaping memory. Activism to address political captivity, in theory, could shatter the orderliness of the museum, tilt its containers, empty contents through exit doors and windows, there the possibilities of new movement stories might emerge if the potentially disorderly, indifferent, apathetic stumble upon something that would make them move. Um, can you hear me? So there's definitely time um, that we've devoted um, for question and answer and some discussion. And we ask that you come here um, to these very intimidating two mic set up. Um, and they're set up this way for two reasons. One, so that everybody who's here can hear the questions that you're answering. Um, and two, so that um, the, the, the question is also captured in the recording that the Haven Center is doing. Okay, so if folks wouldn't mind coming this way to pose your questions, we would appreciate that very much. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess my question is, um, do you think there's a problem with the requirement that people get a little bit more mainstream in order for their message to be received? And the reason I'm asking that is because I'm thinking about, as a culture, um, we don't like extremes of anything. Um, if it's blackness, we don't like 
people to be too black. If it's Asian-ness, we don't like them to be too Asian. If it's um, funny, we don't like people who are too funny all the time. So as a culture, whatever, I mean, seriously, if you think about it, any attribute that you think of, we don't like the extremes of it. We prefer something that's sort of in the middle and, and that everyone can relate to. And I don't know if there's anything wrong with that, if it's effective. Um, so I'm wondering, do you see a problem with that? you know, the colonizing, I'm going to do a Fanonian turn, you know, the colonizing culture. And so what I was trying to talk about here in terms of the rehabilitation project, right, around respectability, that it's dishonest. Like whatever we might value about uniformity and whatever we want to, however we want to think about ourselves as being accepted and acceptable and not on the extreme, right? The truth is that, you know, American democracy only functions with some semblance of inclusivity because of extremists, right? Because it was the only way to undo it as it was originally fashioned. So from Susan B. Anthony, I mean, we could go through the, you know, how, you, how did you get the Bill of Rights? I mean, how you got anything to humanize that original project which was, you know, white male land owning, um, was from extreme, I mean, how did you no longer become a colony of Britain, right? And the only thing, and this is, I mean, it's a good question because here's the thing about, this is my argument, which you know from yesterday. This is the thing about the black condition under American society, which has historically been based on many things, including white supremacy is that there really is no way to inherently be normal within white supremacy, even if you're white. Because, I mean, if you're white under white supremacy, you're supposed to be endowed with these spectacular abilities. I remember, like, it was totally dumb of me to be surprised at this, but in the 1980s, working around the anti-apartheid movement and hearing of homeless Afrikaners, I was like, what happened, you know? I mean, because you're white in South Africa, and then, like, how did you end up having emotional disarray or family that kicked you? Being human, right? And so this charge to be a master race is as onerous, but not with the same vulnerability to social and physical death as it is to be a subordinate or inferior race. And this is part of the American legacy. So when I think about these women, there is nothing in terms of a promise of a future unless they engage in extreme acts. You know, part of the reason Claudette Colvin couldn't be a poster person wasn't just that she got, you know, pregnant at 15. It's the way she got off the bus. She, you know, it wasn't like going to church. It wasn't like, okay, I'm gone. It's like, kicking, scratching, biting, which, I mean, I'm just to break it down. Like, if you had a young child and an adult was attempting to traumatize them, you would tell them to use everything in the arsenal to get away. So, and, you know, in terms of an individual level, we get it. In terms of a political level, we don't get self-defense. And this goes back to the talk yesterday about the angelic black. The, an, the angelic black under the most severe conditions of incursions, right? Both physical, emotional, intellectual, verbal, different forms of violence, has to maintain a civility. I mean, look at the, the footage of the civil rights movement. Look at some of the black women. They go to these marches to face German shepherds that have been trained to attack black people, white men who've been trained to attack black people, 
and any white people who get in between them when they're trying to attack black people, right? And they go in pumps and nylons and pearls and white kid gloves, like they're going to church. And they have, ha you know, and it's, it is, so there's this, this moment when you're looking at these images where you're struck by this performance of femininity and decorum in a war theater, in a war zone. And, we're, and to be like Claudette Colvin, to spit, to curse, to scratch, to kick, and have to have grown men, multiple, get you off. Because you're hanging on through real, you know, you're not walking, you're not singing, we shall overcome, you're like, you know. That becomes something that has to be repudiated because it becomes a stain on the larger group that's attempting to establish itself within the norm. But change comes from you know, and on every level, in the academic research, in the sciences, in the arts, change comes from people who keep pushing that envelope. The only thing is to push it as already racially stigmatized as an inferior entity is to incur particular types of risk. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. Um, I actually have two, two questions, um, if, if I may. One is about um, respectability and um, whether or not that can also be used as a form of resistance. And I'm thinking about Rosa Parks, who in some ways, either she or the, or the movement created this aura of respectability around her intentionally. Right, they intentionally hid her militancy. Right, I mean, so th that that's one question, and then the other was um, uh, how we define political prison uh, imprisonment. Right, especially given what you're talking about yesterday about you know the criminalization and condemnation of blackness. Right, um, or of course my own personal interest thinking about Joanne Little, who becomes a political prisoner even though she's sort of the common criminal incarcerated for breaking an entry in larceny, right? So anyway, those are two sort of. Yeah, those are great. And I really hope we have a, a dialogue. I mean, but, and we were talking last night and you brought up Little and I want to hear much more. Those, you know, we could talk hours in terms of the two things that you brought up. But let's maybe start with Little and then I'll just go on and on. You'll have to remind me about the first question. But OK, so this is interesting. So the white feminists pick up Angela Davis as an icon. Gloria Steinem does. And that's going to be very helpful in terms of mainstreaming particular ideas. And then decades later, you've heard of critical resistance, crit resist beyond the prison industrial complex, right? So there's a nonprofit in um, the Netherlands that gives Angela $50,000 to do something about incarceration. And they're thinking about, quote, the common prisoner, not the political prisoner. And Steinem raises $200,000 for the first crit resist, which is at Berkeley. But as I'm saying, do you see some of the contradictions that are coming up? Um, because with that kind of money coming in, you please your funders. And this is what I said earlier about King. You know, his funders, you know, came down and made it clear, including the, um, is it Walter Ruther? Right. So the, yeah, the labor unions, like, we're writing you some big checks. If you still want to see those checks, then we really don't want to hear about the Vietnam War. And we really don't want to have a critique of capitalism. And the word imperialism has to go. Just stick to the script, which is mainstream civil rights, integration. You know, stay with the script, right? And so, you know, Joanne Little is a very interesting figure because not only was she a petty criminal, but also when she was incarcerated, her white jailer tried to rape her. And he brought in a pickaxe or ice pick as a weapon to, you know, this is my weapon, so this is my hour or two with you, right? And what she did is she took it and she stabbed him and she killed him. And then she fled. So on one level, you would think respectable white feminists would be like, oh, let's turn the page. But Angela writes a piece on Joanne Little for Ms. Magazine. 
which is, you know, what's spinning off of Gloria Steinem and um, Bella Abzug and all the mainstream white feminists. And I've, I've heard people say different things about that, and I think here's, here's where they were going, and I'm not sure. So I really want to read your work, so I hope you email me. Um, were they using Joanne Little, right? Is there something fungible about the black female body and black female suffering that it's a good trope or narrative to talk about rape at large? And the only other parallel I can think is the historian uh, Nell Painter, who used to be at Princeton and retired, and her book on is it Sojourner Truth, right? Where she actually does this critique and says, Sojourner Truth never bared her bosom and said, ain't I a woman? Because the decorum of respectability for black women at that time was like, not to do this in an abolitionist movement, right? But white feminists needed, you know, they weren't allowed to speak because white abolitionist men were hogging the mic. And so what they could do is use this black, fungible female body and shame the white men, right? Because they're looking at this exposed black woman's body and she's like, look at my, I like plowed, I gave birth to 10 kids, that I, so there's, so there's a plasticity to the black female form that's useful for different movements, but may not actually focus or be concerned about the needs, specific needs of black women themselves. Um, but it's really complicated. So yes, respectability is important. I mean, look, I dressed up for you tonight, right? So. There's something about the performance of a middle class persona, the performance of a degree of education, which hopefully you would take me a little bit more seriously or seriously in a different way than you would quote Ramona Africa or somebody like Ramona Africa. But that's a game, that's a shell game, right? Um, what was the first, the first thing you were? And, and the, right. The was able to use that. Right. And so when the, when they first encountered Martin Luther King, he had just come out of Boston um, theological, you know, with a PhD in divinity. He was like what 26. He didn't know how to organize, and he hadn't been in the South for a while. And he was a romantic. Like he, you know, he fell in love with a white student, and it was that proverbial. You tell your mom, and you're like, don't you bring that woman back south. You know, so he ends up with credit, not like she was second choice, but you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on. Because he's 26, he's growing up, he's finding himself, he's trying to get out of his father's shadow. And what happens is that E.D. Nixon, who's a labor organizer, Joanne Robinson, who's at the local black community college, um, they plan this bus boycott, and they're like, well, we have to have somebody respectable. They didn't say we have to have somebody who actually knows how to organize. <coughs> and we have to have somebody who's neutral, who's new to town. So the black churches have carved up. They have their fiefdom, their territory, turf. You know, we don't want to choose this black preacher because the other one will be pissed, da 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 da. And, we ha and, he, and it has to be a man because nobody will follow a woman. And do you see, I mean, and was it shrewd, shrewd and strategic? Yes. But also, do you see how you capitulate to middle class status, to patriarchy, to religiosity, Christianity as the state religion. And then they're like, who, who could we, and they're like Martin Luther King. And that's how he became Martin Luther King. And did he know what he was doing? Absolutely not. Did he eventually grow into knowing what he was doing? Yes. And as he grew, he became less respectable. So the same Martin Luther King who fired Ella Baker and she had to come down from New York City to tell him how to organize SCLC because the black preachers couldn't get it off the ground. The same king who fires Ella Baker becomes a king that gives that poignant, you know, I may not get there with you, but I've seen, you know, my eyes have seen. It's kind of like, I'm going to die pretty soon. It's going to be premature and violent. But I promise you as a people, I mean, it's, it's visionary, it's beautiful, it's seductive. And there's, there's no way that he can deliver as a political strategist. So there's some mystery element about black liberation that is not 
um, that cannot be articulated, which I'm fine with. Like nobody can figure out, given the critiques that were laying down about imperialism, you know, democracy being wedded to captivity, the black middle class fleeing from impoverished blacks, nobody can kind of figure out how this is gonna have a happy ending, but people still struggle. But I would say that these compromises always bring you full circle. It's like W.B. Du Bois, like when he writes his memoirs, he wrote Ida B. Wells out of the anti-lynching campaign. And then when he's eventually fired from the NAACP for being too radical, he starts bemoaning the absence of a radical community. But he chose liberalism because it was a pragmatic move. But by the end of his life, he's like, I don't believe in the talented tenth. You know, because they're, they're American like other Americans. They want personal acquisition, they want power, they want achievement. And then you have a trickle-down theory of racial uplift like a trickle-down theory of class rising, right? So I don't know if that kind of addressed. Um, I just had a question regarding uh, C.C. McDonald, just like within the context of this history, um, just all of the things that I guess she did wrong. Um, how do we look at, at her in, in incarceration? Yeah quote unquote did wrong, yeah. So you probably want, I don't think everybody knows. You probably want to give a quick summary. I don't think everybody. Oh, um. Cece McDonald uh, was a trans woman from Minneapolis um, and she was, I mean, a attacked. I think she was just on the street and, um, and she fought back and did she kill? Yeah, yeah. Um, her attacker and then was incarcerated and convicted, I think, so. She is actually currently in incarcerated, and um, yeah, that's sort of the basics. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, I think that ties to also what you were asking about social slash political prisoners, like this designation. It's like a really, okay, it's really good question. These are all good questions, and I don't have an answer, so you know that, right, um, to anything. So, See, one of the things, this, I'm gonna have to link it to history and come forward. Okay, so King really wanted Bayard Rustin. He did not want Ella Baker. The quote, problem with Bayard Rustin is that he was out gay man. And so, even though he kept coming south and talking to King, and he's one of the people who persuaded King to take the angelic approach, right? To get rid of the armed guards, you know, the guys with the shotguns, the black men with shotguns on the porch, to try to keep the Klan from firebombing and killing King and his wife, Coretta Scott, and their small children. So, transgender or queerness inside black movements, I would say inside any movements that are not movements around sexual liberation, are viewed as problematic because the movements are in part, again, I hope we discuss this because it's just my opinion, are still wedded to respectability. And nothing is more problematic, particularly around a black body that has been so, that has been a sexual commodity for centuries, right? Nothing is more problematic than black sexuality. So remember Audre Lorde says there's a difference between the erotic and the pornographic. The problem becomes with black people is that they were never given that choice that one simply becomes pornographic under enslavement or the convict prison lease system. Or, you know, we could talk about how guards supplement their income by organizing prostitution rings in prison because women are held in men's prisons, right? And disproportionately, it's women of color who get incarcerated. So the guards have the keys to your cell and, you know, prisoners, male prisoners always have contraband always can figure ways to get money out of the canteen. And so you pay, I mean, so I think, you know, the connections with Joe and Little, you know, in terms of vulnerability of life. So when you have to be heterosexual because the culture is homophobic, so, you know, check that on your respectability list or you have to perform as if you were. And two, you have to be nonviolent. I mean, that's part of the script. The angelic black is a pacifist. 
and does not engage in physical self-defense. So, and then three, your, your victim, if you put it that, or your aggressor cannot be white. So, I mean, if you kill, I mean, you know the stats on death row, right? If you kill a white person, you're three to four times more likely to get the death penalty because, you know, and the Supreme Court made its ruling like, yeah, that's not fair, but too bad. You know, so they weren't going to, you know, ban the death penalty again, or I think it was, um, I can't remember all these legal cases, but you probably know, the one out of Georgia, I'm not Georgia trying to, DX, there was an, another one, an, an older, a one from the 1980s, somebody was on death row and made the argument that the death row was meted out, hmm? for, I think that said, it was, that it was um, disproportionately <coughs> meted out based on race. And the Supreme Court ruled, well, that's the way it happened, but we didn't intend it and just live with it or die with it, right? So there were three strikes already to have a, a sexuality that was non-conforming and, and to be out with it, right? To be black, which is non-conforming, and to engage in physical self-defense. And so, as a persona, would there be a campaign, of, you know, would black churches talk about this on Sunday? I haven't heard any. You know, there's another case in Newark 7, which, have you heard? These are women from uh, New Jersey. You guys have heard? Okay. So, they're um, really young women, um, teens, early 20s, black lesbians who were coming from New Jersey into the village to party, right? And actually, youth were coming from Harlem in the Bronx to party down to the village because it was safer. In this weird way, which I think we might know being in these predominantly white environments, there's an invisibility to blackness in these predominantly white environments. Like, you know, it's like you're overly present and you're absent simultaneously. And so that's perceived as a space to dress the way you want to, not have to worry about what your hair looks like, et cetera, et cetera, what your sexual you know, desires are, who your, partner are, your partners are. So there was all this language was emerging in the village because the West Village is a gentrified zone, a very moneyed people. Not predominantly, you know, it's not predominantly trans or gay money, but it's predominantly white and you're in fluid, or you, you can't pay the rent down there. So the language was about these invading hordes of, hordes of black and brown teens invading our safe, queer, affluent, white space. So the women came in to party and they were being followed by a black street vendor and he was yelling at them and he was you know, making um, aggressive remarks and then he caught up with them and there was a physical altercation. They had had a friend in high school, I can't remember how old she was, but she was a teenager. When she had walked past the construction site, men had yelled something at her, and she had turned around and said, I am not into men, they don't interest me. And basically they beat her to death. So the women had in their bags like a kitchen knife, like a steak knife. And so when the altercation emerged, they practiced their version of self-defense. And when the trial was held, the judge, <laughs> the judge, uh, and they're incarcerated now, and they're like some of them had two-year-olds and three-year-olds, and it made no difference. The judge meted out this um, sentence, and the, the man lived, but he had la they had lacerated, I think, you know, his kidney or liver or something like that, and he was hospitalized, but it wasn't life-threatening wounds, and he had attacked them first. But he was read as a heterosexual male, even though a black male. And they were read as trans or queer black females. And so the judge says, when he's sentencing them, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. And that was part of his sentencing mandate. And so there was something about being black female or black lesbian in that context, which meant that your suffering was irrelevant, but the discipline that would be meted out to you would be read in the way that you would talk to a three-year-old, that you would be infantilized. So you were stripped of complete agency. So there's no notion of self-defense. It's just wayward, delinquent girls who are out of control. 
who don't have the right sexual orientation, who don't know that when a man is promising to F them, that it's a compliment, who, you know, who, you know they went all down the list. And so their assertion of arrows among themselves and just arrows of being friends and being able to protect each other was trumped by a pornographic culture even though it was legal. Does that make sense what I just said? So the point was to dominate them and so dominate their sexuality, which is why I'm not a huge fan of respectability because it always comes back to bite you in your Achilles heel. It, it doesn't, one, it's, un, I mean, there have been these black feminists who've critiqued the cult of true womanhood. It simply does not work. And Lindsay and I, we were talking about the, the talented 10th or Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, the um, historian at Harvard, who wrote Righteous Discontent, and how the majority of poor black women in the South hated black middle class women, the talented 10, who were telling them how to dress and to abstain from premarital sex and to raise their children this way and to don't drink, don't party, you know, show up to church on Sunday. And so there was this burden that black respectability places onto people who understand that it's like, it's a mythic attainment. It's not even, you can't even get it. It's elusive. And, and one of the things we talked about earlier today is how the notion of black town and Tim actually came from the white, not even middle class, the white upper class. They created the phrase. They funded Spelman and Morehouse. They named them after themselves, Lawrence, you know, the Rockefeller, Lawrence Spelman, Morehouse. You know, and they created it as a buffer zone between respectable white American, because nobody thinks about poor white people. They're ir largely irrelevant, you know? Which is interesting how race, you know, unless it's a conflict, right, between poor whites and, you know, poor blacks or whatever. But they were to be a buffer zone between a black mass majority that didn't believe in respectability or that it was attainable without access to jobs and wealth. Right? To be poor and respectable means that your kids don't eat. Some people would tell you, which is why they're in the underground economy. So women who do prostitution or sex workers, like I feed my kids, they have clothes, they're clean, I'm a good mom. So the narrative about re what are you, are you gonna pay my bills? And if you're not, then please shut up. So that talented tenth was to be the model of respectability to the mass when capitalism is not structured for the mass to be self-sufficient and to provide for itself because it needs a labor pool it can exploit. Mm -hmm. I have one, um, one addition to something that you said and then a question about prisoners. Um, the addition that I would make is that um, I think that transgender and intersex people and gender nonconforming people are seen as unrespectable or not respectable even within movements for queer liberation and gender liberation, <laughs> um, which is, is, a, is a theme that I really appreciate because the work that I do personally um, is writing to a lot of prisoners who are openly gay or openly transgender prisoners who've been convicted of sex offenses. So if we can think of any less respectable conviction to have, and a lot of the, um, in some cases, clients through the work that I do around housing, and in some cases, just people who've found me and have, we've started corresponding, a lot of what they talk about is ways that they either attempt to resist from within prison, even though they were never revolutionaries, they were never radicals, um, or ways that they are just simply barred from ever being able to resist within prison because they're in solitary confinement or something like that. And so I'm thinking a lot about how um, a lot of work around prison abolition sets up these respectability um, binaries between people convicted of like bad, dirty things who don't deserve rights as prisoners and people convicted of things that we absolutely are in alignment with as radical people. Um, and I think we absolutely need to be in alignment with a lot of people for very different reasons. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about other stories that you have, either from some of the prisoners that we've talked about or you've talked about tonight, 
um, or other people who fit into more of a gray area who have been incarcerated or have like faced that that brutality um, in ways that were radical even if that person was not like a member of a larger radical movement but it's still a political imprisonment does that does that make a thanks I think it goes back to this this whole distinction between social prisoners and political prisoners because some people would argue that's a false distinction I maintain it and I've argued against people who argue it's a false distinction but um, uh, the, the photo on the, on the poster from the New Abolitionist has an essay from, uh, I think the group is called Men Against Sexism, which the contributor is a white male, he's out now, but the, the group, as I understand, and I'm sorry, I don't remember everything I've edited over the years, um, and I think that book came out in 2005 or something, but so this is a group of gay, I think largely white men incarcerated, right? And had reached a point about violence inside of the prison and also the prison guard's willingness to tolerate it or even exacerbate it, right? And this probably ties into CC in the New York Seven. They armed themselves. Now I have, you know, we haven't talked about armed struggle here, not to say it's appropriate, but um, in this essay, and I would just suggest, you know, I can't recall all the details. I just know when he sent it to me and I was reading it and editing it and like including an anthology that has like Asada Shakur and Leonard Peltier, it was, it was like, where does this fit? Like, how does this whole narrative fit? But I mean, he actually argues that violence against the men who belong to this cadre diminish. But the way they did it was quite phenomenal. I mean, it was, it, was, it was, in my mind, it was akin to George Jackson. If you read, there's one thing to read Soledad Brother, his prison writings, and then to read the, the book that was published after his death, um, Blood in My Eye, you know which actually the phrase comes from his mother. People couldn't contribute to anybody. And then, oh, his father or nobody. But it's really his mother who wrote this in a letter to him and it becomes the title of the book. And that was this, this sense that if someone engaged in physical aggression against you and these types of environments where you had no legal recourse or protection from the state, because it a, it's a predatory environment and the state is actually one of your predators, then you have the right to make any weapon you need and defend yourself. So the argument became violence against everybody in our group subsided. So whatever the stereotype was about gay men, particularly gay white men being effeminate and being weak, I mean, we will counter that stereotype with a certain kind of militarist strategy within prison. And we will suffer lockdown for it and beatings for it. And so that was, and it was interesting because, you know, then they have this whole critique of patriarchy and sexism and homophobia, but they, they had this strong militarist um, strain to them. And, I mean, I've said, like, since I've been here, I grew up in a military family and I was in ROTC. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, I bonded with my dad by shooting magnums at firing ranges at his request. He was totally bizarre. <laughs> but, so I'm not freaked out by the notion of these types of endeavors. And I would argue that there's a sizable population in the United States that is not. But they deploy it in the service of the nation state. And so they become decorated, not really decorated that much, because if you think about the vets who are in poverty or homeless, whatever, but they're used. So this becomes like heroic. And it's also transgender. It's not just men who are doing it, it's women who are doing it, it's not just um, cisgender, it's transgender people who are doing it. So in the service of the state, this is simply logical and respectable. In the service of the protection of your community, it's illegal, right? And so this goes back to that split between the social prisoners and the political prisoners. Okay, there, at one count there was about 100 people defined as political prisoners. That, you know, we use that term because Amnesty, which sets the gold standard, would not. But amnesty for a long time would not take on the U.S. about a number of things because 
disproportionately its funders came from the United States. So we get the European branch of Amnesty, the London branch, to write a critique of what was going on in the U.S., right? So they were kind of, you know, like, it's the U.S., so you can't, like, totally piss them off, right? So they use the term prisoners of conscience, and they put Mumi on that list. Mumi is a former Black Panther. Um, there, there were a hundred, and they've been dying, largely from cancer. There's over two million people who would be considered social prisoners. People have made the argument that given that the prison industrial complex is racially and class driven, and also there's that gendered aspect I, t yes, you know, I talked about, if you're a poor Native American woman, if you're a poor black woman, if you're poor white, you're just much more likely to go to prison for anything and everything. And that includes also men um, and transgender people. You can tell that I'm trying to figure this one out. See, I kept the term restrictive, and I made this argument in, I think, the New Abolitionists, or I made it in Warfare, in one of the anthologies. I, I think the resistance has to have a clear critique and analysis of the state and empire to, to be configured as political resistance. And I personally am ambivalent, and I know it's, I hear what you said about people who are incarcerated for sex crimes, right? Or sexual aggression and how they're stigmatized. But knowing, you know, the one in three women are survivors of sexual assault, attempted assault, I still have my own ambivalence that I'm working through. So, You know, so for me, maybe it's my naivete or my romanticism. It's easier to designate people who were formally organized in a political party that I recognize, even if it was something like the MOVE movement that didn't even look like a political party, um, that had an ideology I could map or trace, then to include every person who is incarcerated in a racist, classist, homophobic, sexist society. And part of it is that, you know, the people inside are not that much different from the people outside, which means there's some really reactionary people. And, you know, this, this is a weird moment of like, you know, this different forms of radicalism that we espouse to or we try to recover, we try to identify ourselves with. We're probably, I'm probably more comfortable organizing with a small group of people who I politically trust and I can map their trajectory than I am with a mass of people that I'm like, I don't know your position on women, I don't know how you feel about transgender, I don't know how you feel about the state or you know, the invasion of Iraq. And so your status as being a victim of the state is not sufficient for me to give you that designation. Am I being stingy? Probably. But there's, there's a conservatism in my, nobody believes it. But I'm actually a really conservative thinker in a, in a number of different ways. And I, I gave the analogy between um, Cuba and Nicaragua earlier in the day, right? And I hope it works now, and it probably didn't work earlier, Patrick, but, okay, so I'd been to both countries, and one thing that struck me was the Nicaraguans were always grateful, or seemed always grateful, this is under the Sandinistas, right? And before Reagan does the unholy war, you know, with the School of Americas and Fort Benning, and, you know, training counter-revolutionaries, which Elliot Abrams, said in the New York Times have the tendency to kidnap 13-year-old girls. Yeah, because they were turning into sex slaves, right? And we were paying for all that, right? So the Nicaraguans were grateful um, for white progressives, or progressives in general, but white progressives have more money than any other progressive in the United States, so, and more influence. So they were grateful for their intervention in the region, 
and their support of the Sandinistas, right? And they were complicated and they had their own con contradictions. Whereas the Cubans, I felt, weren't all that grateful. You know, I felt, in, in part, they were like, why aren't you doing more? And they had this kind of position like, look, we fought a revolution against incredible odds, including you guys, right? And we survived, and we're not perfect. You know, they became like a stepchild of the Soviet Union, and then there was a special period because the Soviets, you know, when they were falling apart under perestroika and whatever, they pulled the money and then tourism and all that stuff is coming back, including a certain kind of anti-black racism, right? And so I kind of see this as a parallel between social and political prisoners, that they're both under siege by an imperial repressive state. But there's a group that fought in an organized fashion and was able to articulate demands that extended beyond its nucleus, right? And had a vision. So even in defeat, right? I mean, I, we didn't go into all the people who scrolled up here who are dead now, right? Even in defeat, they had left something that we are indebted to. And I would say we're indebted to every individual, every collective that struggles. But for those who can mount a campaign that exceeds our imagination, that's a special kind of indebtedness. And that's, that's the space that I hold for political prisoners. And so my critique of crit resist, like even in their multiculturalism, they're going to include every, you know, all these you know, segments that are stigmatized by the state and society, they're still in an elevated position, all of those poor people. And there's no real peerage. So like the progressives around Nicaragua or around the death squads in Guatemala or the, you know, we unleashed death squads in El Salvador, or we did in Angola, like we were, we were doing stuff all over the globe. There was, you know, this is a weird moment where even the good American is imperialist. Where the rest of the world is to genuflect and say, thank you so much for defending and protecting. And I kind of prefer the person who doesn't make that hand gesture, the digitas impunitas at you. But that was from Caligula. I, just look at your fingers and figure it out. But <laughs> who does say, okay, well, thanks for your effort, and so now what's next? And that, I find, keeps me more honest and allows me to act less as a savior or to perform as some salvific agent for other people's lack of respectability and a pretty tough state. So I don't know if that was helpful or clear, but it's just how I'm functioning right now. Thank you.